Yes, it did, David. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Faith Unaltered. I am just one of your three hosts for this morning. This is crazy. We changed things up a little bit. We're starting at 10 o'clock Eastern instead of 7. So please don't look out for a show tonight. Uh, we will not be doing one. We're doing it now up bright and early. David's tired. Dell's ready to go. And I think my panel is ready to rock and roll as well. We are talking orthodoxy. Why these gents below me, all four of them, are orthodox. And so before we get in 
to introductions. David, brother, it is the start of the weekend. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, man, it's been a crazy week. I've been tired all week. Uh, last weekend was was very busy. I don't know if I told you I went to my mom's uh, best friend's funeral. So we said goodbye to her. And then right after we went to a gender reveal party, <laughs> and which my friends are uh, becoming grandparents. And I got to call them, you know, grandpa and grandma and your next responded. They responded. <laughs> yeah, right. They responded with, no, I'm I'm El Padre. And I was like, no, you're grandpa. Padre. Right, yeah. <laughs> Is there they're from Mexico? So, nice. um, yeah, yeah, it was just very busy. Um, I did make some of the Lord's nectar last week. I started some of that. Um Good old uh, Sangiovese Rosé. <laughs> Sangiovese what? Sangiovese Rosé. I don't know what that means. Yeah, it's an Italian rosé. English. Um, it's blended between uh, Sangiovese uh, grape and okay. the Pinot Grigio. So, um, yeah, it's Mixing pretty it fun. Um, yeah, it's, it's a blend. So, And it turns out to be a wonderful summertime rosé. So, Does you need to call um, it Russellade. That, it Russellade. <laughs> But yeah, that and then just doing the housework and my wife's birthday was last week. So I made her some fondue and chicken piccata. So it was just a busy, busy week and it bled over into the next week uh, or this last week. And I just couldn't wake up this week. It was just <laughs> it was rough because I had a lot of schoolwork and I had to get a lot of that done. So yeah. I did get a few papers knocked out. So I am happy with the course I'm on. So other than that, brother, congratulations to you. I love you, um, and I love Dale, and I love the show, and I love all of you uh, that come on here and talk. So I'm just, you know, uh, happy to be here. Right on, man. I finished paying off school finally, so I put my last uh, my last payment on it, and and it's nice. You know, it wasn't that much. I mean, I'm only taking a Greek class, but uh, you know, uh, it's nice to be one step closer out of debt and so I, I i love that but dale brother how are you doing how's your week by the way david how's your back doing i know that uh you had kind of threw that out uh you feel any better oh yeah yeah that that's that was one of the things I think bled over into the week was yeah. that that back pain so yeah. uh yeah it's it's feeling a lot better now okay right on man good dale how's your week and beginning bro this is the like i said this is the start of a fresh weekend so how are you doing this week uh yeah i'm good i think um i just had one other show this week with you tyler on um mm -hmm. uh i'm blanking out on what it no uh dan choppa on mm -hmm. total depravity so right. yeah uh it's been a restful week for me uh <laughs> compared to previous weeks where i have like four or five shows to do so yeah well it was your week off and i felt bad for you know scheduling three shows i remember you told me that after the fact and i'm just like man uh so I, but i appreciate uh you being a part of that dale so guess what so dr layton flowers actually reviewed that video i, I saw you comment, know that yeah. okay yeah. yep yep he reviewed that and so we're gonna have warren uh, mcgrew on wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern uh, to get the other side of the debate. So I'm excited about that. But guys, all right, thank you so, so much for your introductions. As you can see, we have a panel below us, and two of these guys have been on the show before, but two have not. And so I am going to say thank you, Father Jonathan and Joshua Sherman, for joining us. And I'm going to skip you guys for, for just a second and get Michael and Kevin, who have not been on the show before, uh, to introduce themselves, give a little bit of background about themselves uh, to their audience. So, any, meeny, miny, Michael, you go first. And by the way, thank you for uh, being here. I'm excited to have you on, uh, brother. This is going to be a fun, fun topic, but you have the floor. Tell the audience a little bit uh, about yourself. Sure thing. Good to meet you all. Michael Johnson here. I am 42. I like long walks on the beach. Oh, no, that's not that <laughs> good. But, uh, no, actually, I'm, single. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I, I grew up Protestant, actually, and I didn't even know that orthodoxy existed until two years ago. Like, I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know it even, like, you know, like that gap in your knowledge, I just didn't know. So uh, I just went about doing my thing. I my undergrad's in psychology, so I was very interested in psychology. Nice. At one point, I was really interested in debate, and so I just loved arguing, which is not always a good place to be. <laughs> it's not usually a good place to be. You're going to fit right in here. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. For sure. Um, but so, and then my graduate degree was actually in acupuncture, 
Um, and then I've lived all over the country. And then I uh, found orthodoxy or orthodoxy found me. And so here I am. Right on, right on. So how, what, I'm just out of curiosity, like I never wanted to get stuck with needles, right? Like I, I'm a tattoo guy, but there's a difference, I think. But it, so what's more acupuncture like and how did you get into acupuncture? Um, so it actually got rid of my migraines when I was in college. Okay. I was on the the pill carousel is what I call it, where, you okay. know, you have all the pills you take for your migraines and then you have the pills to, to take for your pills because you're having side effects from the pills. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't like it. And then my Kung Fu teacher, I was in Kung Fu at the time, started doing acupressure stuff mm -hmm. and um, and it got rid of my migraines. And I thought, this is awesome. And then I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to move to the West Coast. So I told my family in the South. I'm moving to Seattle and I'm learning acupuncture. See ya, right? Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. And it well, doesn't hurt for the most part. The the way I do it doesn't hurt, but, um, but the way others do does hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people actually intentionally want it to hurt. It's, it's okay. according to the culture. It's according to what they believe about how it's supposed to feel, but I'm a big wimp. So I just make it. Gentle. Yeah. Sounds like they're freaks. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> all right, right on, right on. I mean, I know, you know, the deep tissue versus just the little, you know, just do, 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 do. Um, I, I never was a big pain guy. You know what I mean? Like I said, I've got tattoos, but they don't hurt. Um, I'm not kinky like that either. Yeah, yeah I, I know, right? <laughs> but all right, Michael. Well, I am glad you're here. This is, like I said, this is going to be a fun discussion. And so thank you for participating in it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Kevin, you are up, my friend. This is your first time also on Faith Unaltered, so go ahead. You've got the floor. Um. Okay, well, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I discovered Orthodoxy through, I was actually raised Roman Catholic, and Orthodoxy was always just kind of um, something we talked about as like, hey, they, you know, are cool. They do a lot of, they have a lot of the same sort of, basis that we do the same sort of uh history but for some reason they're not part of us and that was pretty much all i knew about orthodoxy at the time um and then i became a protestant for quite some time uh, i was actually a minister in the seventh day adventist movement uh for a while and then just over time i was reading my bible every day and kind of discovering that, hey, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that just doesn't comport with Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, to make a long story short, that led me down a trail of discovery. I started a small ministry called Freed Indeed Ministries that was mostly about trying to help Seventh-day Adventists to come to the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the process of debating a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, I had this one line that I would always say, which was basically, um, well, you know, Seventh-day Adventism didn't start until 1844. So where, who were all the Christians before 1844? Um, and then one day I met someone who was actually a Roman Catholic. Catholic, and he turned that around on me. He said, okay, well, uh, Presbyterianism started in 15-whatever, so where were all the Christians before 15-whatever? Mm -hmm. And so I said, hey, you know, that's a good question. So I started looking into it a little bit more and uh, discovered that, hey, before 15-whatever, people didn't believe what I believed. And that was a little bit unsettling because I had been told by my seminary and by so many other people that what I believed was the gospel and you had to believe what I believed in order to be saved. And so it was very odd to me that these beliefs that were supposedly the gospel didn't exist prior to a point in history. We'll call it John Calvin, Martin Luther, whatever, um, why, why didn't the gospel exist before that? So then I asked myself, okay, well, what is the gospel? And that basically led me down a path that eventually led to orthodoxy. And there's some personal stuff too, that I've discussed on my own channel that kind of helped give me the final push. 
but you know, I know you're pressed for time, so I won't get into all the nitty gritty, but ultimately I just really love orthodoxy and how it has given me the ability to really throw myself completely into um, the church and not be church. Isn't just something you do on Sunday. It's your whole life. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And I also study, I also live on the West coast, like Michael was talking about. And I also studied psychology, interestingly enough, uh, for a time, never got into acupuncture though. Um, so, you know, I don't know about that. I don't think I can do it, man. I, I really don't. Uh, man, I don't I don't know. I might, I might try it one day, YOLO, right? But other than that, I, I don't know. But all right, Kevin. Well, thank you so much again uh, to our panel, Michael, Father Jonathan, Joshua Sherman, and Kevin. You guys are amazing. And um, ba- man, Father Jonathan and Josh Sherman, you guys have really been a big influence on this part of my journey and have helped me out a lot you know, with my questions about orthodoxy and things like that. Father Jonathan participated in the debate with Samuel Frag on um, icons and Sherman has been family, you know, on this show ever since I think we started. And so guys, it's, I'm so happy to have you. So, okay. So what we'll do is I sent this whole panel that we've got on the uh, show today, uh, a list of questions, and I'm going to go a little bit out of order And so the way I figured we could do this was I'll pick someone to start uh, on this on this this question. I'll ask you the question. And then while everybody else is thinking on it, once you get done, uh, then whoever wants to jump in uh, can jump in. So I figured that would be uh, the most, you know, realistic and practical way to do this. So Sherman, I am going to start with you, my friend. Um, Let me so. I said that I wanted to hit on these questions uh, to begin with while we have everyone here, because I know you've got to take off here in a little bit. Kevin, you've got to uh, run. And Father Jonathan, you got uh, you do as well. So let's get out of the way. We're going to start with the Bible. We're going to start with tradition. And so my question, Sherman, first of all, how long have you been involved in orthodoxy? Uh, so I visited an orthodox church uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was the first time I'd been, and then um, fairly quickly, uh, you know, became, you know, started to attend regularly with my family, and I became a catechumen. And then um, last uh, Easter, last Pascha, um, last year, uh, was was received into the church. So you've been a full fledged member now for right at a year, just about, yeah. Okay. All right. And which and... means I don't, I know next to nothing. So <laughs> take everything I say with a grain of salt and. <laughs> Well, and that's why we have Father Jonathan here to correct everybody the trunk. So <laughs> he's, uh, but okay. All right, Sherman. So let me ask you this then. Given your two years, because let me tell you all something. For those who don't know, if we have uh, Protestants watching, being a catechumen, I mean, you were involved in the church. This is part of catechumen, uh, being a catechumen in the Orthodox Church, right? Uh, my priest anyway, he wants me to be at services regularly. He wants me to participate in activities outside of the church that are church involved, that is parish involved. And as well as, you know, this is the time we learn about things. This is the time we're studying that we are. I I, I love the book. uh, One of the books that I was reading, it was Welcome to the Orthodox Church by Frederick and Matthew Green. And she said, and, and this is in multiple books. She, hers is just the one that comes to mind. But she said, you can learn about orthodoxy by reading about it, right, through books and things like that. But you can't learn orthodoxy without participating in it. And so that's, I I just want to let everyone know that, uh, Protestants and even Roman Catholics that might be watching. Uh, But Sherman, let me ask you this. So two years you've been in now, how has your understanding of the Bible changed since becoming orthodox? Oh man, um, I, I mean, on some level it has and it hasn't. Okay, right, um, because there's there's nothing about looking at it through through an orthodox lens that sees it as anything less than than what you see it in in Protestant terms, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's scripture. This is this is what we've received. Um, this is um, this is what we believe, right? Um, but then, and in some ways, it has changed a bit. 
Um, I was never like super deeply into the whole like inerrancy, like every single thing that's talked about in every single way on every single topic needs to comport to how we understand things on a, like a scientific level or whatever. Um, so I didn't carry that with me into and like I, I kind of let that go probably in my early 20s I go when I was in college. Um, so I, I didn't have that to kind of let go of at the time. Um, but really looking at it and saying, you know, this is uh, the the written word of God that tells the story uh, mm -hmm. that is more in full uh, that we see condensed in the gospel, which is the proclaimed word of God, which tells us the truth about the living incarnate word of God, Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. That kind of clarity about how these things fit together um, took a while for me. And it's something that I feel like it has been has become more clear to me since being in the orthodox church because it's not that the bible's not the word of god but you have to understand those relationships and, and understand that like you know when we're talking about the word of god we're talking about christ we're talking about god incarnate we're talking about this living moving breathing person that that we we interact with that we love that loves us that like all of that is there and then mm -hmm. that informs how we understand um scripture being the word of god Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not to say that there's no Protestant that sees things that way. Uh, I have just seen that that way of seeing things together more clearly myself personally since since being involved in the Orthodox Church. OK, so when because you said that you didn't carry the the wooden literalistic and I and I know that's not necessarily fair. Right. It's not a literal rendering of the scriptures right that protestants hold to at the same time they recognize you yeah. know poetry they recognize the different genres that are in scripture so what do you mean exactly uh what since protestants recognize that as well what's the difference really with how you are viewing scripture now and what's changed exactly so and really what I'm looking at when I'm talking about something like inerrancy is okay. and, and, and the inspiration of scripture is, okay. you know, are you talking about every layer of meaning that I could possibly mean to this text has to be true. Mm. Right. So um, if I'm reading the text and I'm saying, I read the text personally as a, a literal creation account, literal six days, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And if that's not the way that this is actually presenting things, then it's false. Like mm -hmm. if that's the way you're coming at it, you're missing a lot of things that the scripture is saying, right? Um, and th that so you can read it that way, you cannot read it that way. But if you're thinking that that's the only way to read it, that's where I start to have an issue. Uh, because there are a lot of other things going on in, in Genesis 1. Um, I really do think that is like a, 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 a temple ordination text, if you will. Um, and um, and that has a lot of implications later on, some of them that, that connect into orthodoxy too. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Anybody else want to jump in on this real quick? Or don't all do it uh, Sure. Want? So one thing that, oh, sorry, Father Jonathan, you go ahead. Uh, just something that, that Joshua said that I'd like to comment on when you're talking about reading the scriptures and, and interpreting and understanding things like mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> I can look at something and I can say, I wonder what that means. Mm -hmm. And I could be reading that with a Protestant friend who might ask the same question. And they might come to a, a certain conclusion, whatever that is. And I can come to a certain conclusion that might be very different. And if both of us claim to have the Holy Spirit, then we have a conundrum. Who is the Holy Spirit enlightening? Who is the Holy Spirit teaching correctly what the meaning of that scripture is? Mm -hmm. But I have an advantage my Protestant friend doesn't. I can go back 1900 years and I can show how the early church fathers who were close to the apostles, some of whom knew the apostles, how they interpreted those <laughs> scriptures. And for me, that's a, and for any Orthodox Christian, that should be a really, really big deal because we don't have to guess anymore. We've had a lot of people who have come before us whose enlightenment by the Holy Spirit has been absolutely tremendous and far and above anything I'll ever see. Mm -hmm. And they have interpreted this stuff for us and they have given us the result of, and, and benefit of their understanding 
uh, in, in some cases, having been taught by the apostles themselves. And so I think for, for Orthodox, that gives a certain not only clarity, but I think it gives a certain assurance that what we know and what we're being taught and what's been handed down to us from generation to generation is true and right and correct. That I like that, Father Jonathan, but let me play devil's advocate for just a second. So what do what do you do if the if you have two or maybe it's even there's no consensus exactly on what a specific scripture says, this church father says this, this church father says this, and there seems to be no consensus. How do we understand those types of texts, or are there are there those types of texts uh, in the Bible? Well, there's not a lot of them. Okay. Uh, th there's very little that, that the fathers have not agreed on. Okay. And, you know, you can certainly find one church father that says something mm -hmm. different from what literally everybody else has said. Yeah. And sometimes what Protestants do is they focus on that one church father. Mm. You know, and they say, oh, look what he said. And we kind of go, OK, so what? And they don't get that part. They don't get the part where we say, so what? Because it's not what everybody else has said, you know. And the Protestants have this problem with an appeal to authority. Because because in their world, when someone big and famous and rich and everything says something. About the scriptures, whether it's Joel Osteen or, you know, whoever it happens to be. Oh, Joel said this, you know, and again, so what? Show me how that's consistent with and show me how that's, um, well, consistent with what the church has always thought and taught and preached and died for. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's in line with, great, Joel's right. But if it's not, um, again, then we have an issue of who, did, who do we choose to believe? We know who we choose to believe. Yeah. And for us, it's very clear. But the idea of, of there not being a consensus, I hear Protestants say this all the time. And sometimes they'll point to really obscure stuff. That really doesn't matter to us at all, at all. Hmm. Okay, so some fathers disagreed, but that doesn't mean the church doesn't have an answer. It means right. those two or three fathers may have disagreed. That's all it means. But usually what I found is there is an answer. Mm -hmm. There always is an answer. Right on, right on. Kevin, I want to get your um, I want to get your input as well. I know you wanted to say something, but let me ask you this, Kevin. So I, I don't want to throw you off. Um, so go okay. ahead and say what you were going to say, and then I've got a question, uh, a follow-up question for you. Okay. So uh, my answer is going to be a little bit different because I think I may have misinterpreted your question because my answer <laughs> seems a little bit different than uh, Joshua or Father Jonathan's. Um, but uh, I, what I was going to say to the question is, as far as how my understanding of the Bible has changed, um, I think the best way to describe it is that I've become a lot more radical in my understandings of the Bible. Um, I just find that I'm much more... Um, so like when I was a Protestant, obviously I was already doing apologetics, talking to people about the Bible, mm -hmm. and... Um, one apologist who I really liked was Ray Comfort. And he said, when I was a brand new Christian, I owned a business and I put up John, not just John 3, 16, but the entire chapter of John 3. I had it printed on these big billboards and put it up in my window so that anybody coming into my business had to read not just John 3, 16, but all of John 3. Mm -hmm. And then he ends that with, and I've become much worse as I've gotten older. And uh, <laughs> and I always think that's, <laughs> that's a funny story. Um, yeah. But that's kind of how I feel about being in orthodoxy. It's like when I was a Protestant, I was so kind of um, like ready to defend the scriptures and talk about the scriptures. And I kind of feel like orthodoxy has made me so much worse, um, at least from the perspective of, of like atheists, um, not uncharitably. Like, I, obviously, orthodoxy <laughs> uh, tends to take away your sharp edge on a lot of these things. But I've become much more like I understand why it matters for mm. Genesis to be historical because of things like what Joshua brought up with the... Uh, I also see Genesis 1 as being a temple construction and these things, but I see how that real history matters so much more because back when I was a Protestant, it was like, we have to understand this as literal 
because leftists don't believe it's literal and mm. it's like yeah right. yeah um but now it's like i have to we have to understand this as real history because otherwise there's a whole lot of stuff that jesus is going to say and do that isn't going to immediately make sense to you unless it's rooted and grounded in something that happens way back here with Abraham. And if you believe that Abraham is just sort of a moral story that isn't true, then what Jesus is saying and doing is, is right. going to go right over your head. So my understanding of scripture has really radically altered in the sense that not necessarily that like, Oh, my, my position on every single text has changed. That's not true. Mm. Um, Protestants have many things that they get right. And, you know, there's many areas of agreement that I still have with all the wonderful people at the Presbyterian Church that I was coming, that I came from. Um, I can have long theological discussions with them without us debating anything. And yet I feel that I'm so much more like I have so much more um, belief in what the Bible says, and I have so much more understanding of like why it matters and mm -hmm. how it even affects my own life. How what Abraham did in whatever BC actually really radically alters how I relate to God. And, you know, I think Tyler made a great point earlier that orthodoxy is something you can learn about in books but in order to really learn orthodoxy you have to experience it and i think to a certain extent in order to understand why orthodoxy makes you have or at least has made me have this really deeper connection to the bible mm -hmm. i think you have to experience it in the liturgy i don't think that's something i can explain i think mm -hmm. you kind of have to see it like okay, I see now why, you know, why working through this passage in this way has really changed that. Um, and then I guess more in line with what Joshua and Father Jonathan were saying, it's also changed in a sense that I don't feel the need to keep sort of reinventing the wheel. It's very liberating that you know, we have the church fathers and we have this unbroken tradition. So if I'm reading Ephesians 2 and I'm scratching my head saying, you know, oh, I wonder what this predestination word means. I don't have to, like John Calvin, come up with a whole systematic theology just to explain why the word predestination is in Ephesians 2. I can just go and read the fathers and say, hey, these guys already figured out what Ephesians 2 is saying, mm. and all I have to do is believe that and then say my daily prayers. <laughs> so right you know, Let me jump in on, on that thought. There's one yeah. more thing I think that, and Joshua, we started, you, you started to speak, and this is all a digression, so I, I apologize for taking mm. up your time. But there's one more thing I think that needs to be said. In, in the Protestant world, a lot of it comes down to what do I think? What is my thinking? What is my interpretation? You know, St. Paul said that we are to have the mind of Christ. It doesn't matter what we think. What matters is what Amen. Christ thinks. You know, we are supposed to be subsumed into Jesus Christ, into his body, into his mind, you know. So we're supposed to submit to that. You know, there is an aspect of us submitting to him because he is Lord and we are his slaves. Yeah. So the idea of, of what, what does it matter what I think, it really doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what Christ thinks. And the, the apostolic fathers, the early church, they had the mind of Christ very, very beautifully. And you know, they suffered for it. They were willing to die for it. And that's why I think the, the idea of, of, as Father Peter Gilquist said a long time ago, very famously, tradition is letting our fathers have a vote. You know, mm -hmm. So th this is kind of really important is to understand that, you know, well, well, what do I think about that? Well, it doesn't matter what you think about it. What matters is what the church thinks about because the church has the mind of Christ. Yeah, Amen. you know, I want to just say real quick, um, so I see a lot of new faces, well, not faces, but a lot of new names in the uh, side chat here in the live chat. So I want to invite every one of our listeners, if you haven't yet, feel free, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you're liking the conversation. Also, you can find us on all of your pod favorite podcasting platforms, Google, Apple, uh, podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, everywhere, uh, iHeartRadio. 
Also, um, if we are taking audience questions, so if you have an audience, uh, if you have a question for one of our panel or for all of our panel, feel free to go ahead and uh, drop that in the comments. If you would like to financially support our ministry, a great way to do that, and we'll get to your question ASAP, Rocky, if that if this happens. Uh, but you can send us a super chat. So if you are watching on Faith Unaltered's channel, Dell is so close on Real Seekers, man. You are right there at the thousand. Um, but uh, since we do have a thousand subscribers on Faith Unaltered, you can send us a super chat and we will get to your question as soon as you send it. If we see that uh, also, you can send us a super sticker if you would like to. And that would be a good way to financially support our ministry. You don't have to do that. If you just want to support our ministry, uh, you can't afford it. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the like button and share with your friends and family. So guys, I want to say this and then I want to get Michael's opinion and I want to do a roundtable um, on this one because bringing up this understanding of it. What do I think? What do I think? I've got a quote from uh, the father of Protestantism, Martin Luther, and I want to get your guys' opinion on this because I've seen this comment quoted halfway, right? In a lot of different Protestant books, a lot of different uh, articles, this quote only gets quoted. And I was shocked whenever I read the rest of this quote. I got it from uh, Father Steve or Father Andrew Damick's uh, orthodoxy and heterodoxy book, and it, it blew me away. And so Martin Luther said this, uh, quote, God once spoke through the mouth of an ass. I will tell you straight what I think. I am a Christian theologian, and I am bound not only to assert, but to defend the truth with my blood and death. I want to believe freely and be a slave and be a slave to the authority of no one, of a council, a university, or a pope. I will confidently confess what appears to me to be true, whether it has been asserted by a Catholic or a heretic, whether it has been approved or reproved by a council, end quote. And so, I, Michael, what do, you, what, what do you think whenever you hear uh, that from uh, Martin Luther? Now, granted, the context, uh, Father Jonathan, you might have to help me out here. Uh, I know Martin Luther is responding to someone I know that doesn't help out very much. I'll look it up while I'm getting uh, Michael's quote because I don't want to quote anybody out of context. I want to give you guys my sources for where I'm getting this from. Right. But, Michael, what do you think whenever you hear um, hear what I just quoted from Martin Luther? Well, can I start with I'm a newbie? So take everything with a grain of salt and I accept it. <laughs> Father, Father Jonathan, feel free to correct if you hear something that you're like, oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> but for me. I would actually, so three or four years ago, would have probably completely related to it. Mm -hmm. um, completely. I would have been like, yeah, I, I completely agree. No authority at all. Like, you know, the authority of what I see in scripture, but no authority beyond that. And then what I started to realize over the years is that everyone, like Father Jonathan was talking about, everybody has their own their own way. Like you look at any one verse, you're going to have thousands, tens of thousands of interpretations for that verse. If you mm -hmm. look at just everyone at different Protestant churches across <clears throat> the world, you're going to have so many different interpretations. So what makes me think that I can trust my own thinking and my own reasoning? Like, do I really think so much of myself that I can read that and decide I'm smart enough that I don't need to look at all this other stuff because I I am my own I'm my own pope. Mm -hmm. I get to decide what I believe is true about this. And that I mean that's a challenge for me because we all have I and mean, we're all sinners. We all have blind spots. And so I think it you know would be a it was a monument to my own ego when I would look at the scripture like that. It was a monument to my own ego about what I I think that it should be as opposed to what's actually there and, and having the mind of Christ like father Jonathan said. So, yeah. Yeah. So this was, so, uh, this was Martin Luther's response to Johann Eck at the, uh, Leipzig debate. And that's where this quote, uh, comes from. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I was talking to a buddy about this, you know, and my question is at this point, you know, if Luther like thought this way, and this is what Sola Scriptura is built off of, right? I mean, this is what we see. I mean, we got, you know, modern day Protestants, we, uh, we appeal to academic scholars uh, in support of our views, right? But at the same time, what's the difference between Luther and Arius? What's the difference between Luther? I don't care if a heretic said it. I mean, would we, 
what would we think if, you know, Luther was an Aryan for crying out loud? You know, but this is this mind frame that really, really bugs me anymore whenever I think about this concept mm -hmm. of Sola Scriptura and, and the person really that, that founded uh, this movement, the Protestant movement as a whole. I mean, this is one of the, and I know uh, Jonathan Pritchett, Dr. Pritchett would uh, disagree with me on this, but, you know, the five solas are the pillars of Protestant, mm -hmm. of the Protestant Reformation. And I know I understand that there's Protestants that deny sola scriptura, deny sola fide, and things like that, depending on how you define faith. But still, these are the pillars of the Protestant Reformation, mm -hmm. and it just it it blew me away. But anybody else want to jump in on this? I, I'd love to. If yeah, if Sherman. Yeah, please. Um, so this actually ties into your first question in a way too. Yeah. Um, one of the things that that is challenging when you're talking about taking an individualistic reading of scripture mm -hmm. is that we do not live in a place where our context remotely resembles the context that scripture was written in we just don't right so mm -hmm. to have someone like martin luther say that and basically say i'm reading scripture this is the way i see it and i will take this to the grave over what anybody else says and then start thinking about it. And, and this was part of my journey in, into becoming Orthodox. You say, okay, he said that, you know, you know, 1517, that's that's a date with this rings in our heads, right? Um, he's, he said that somewhere around that date. Okay, what have we discovered since then that's relevant to biblical studies that puts things in context, mm. right? Uh, we've discovered uh, the Rosetta Stone. So basically everything we know about Egypt, almost everything we know about Egypt, we know long after Martin Luther right? Mm -hmm. The library at Ugarit, uh, which gives us Akkadian and Ugaritic literature, which puts a lot of other ancient Near Eastern, Mesopotamian and Canaanite things in context that tells us more about the Old Testament scriptures long after Martin Luther, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls giving us a, a window into understanding the relationship between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint discovered long after Martin Luther, right? All of these things help to put scripture in context and help us to read it more like the people that originally would would have received the text and understood the text right that context is obviously different from the 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 context in in which um we see that you know the apostles and then uh the church um, moving forward but for me what what really caught my attention was the more that i started to get into protestant scholarship that has been taking account of all of these things that have been recently discovered that's especially talking about dead sea scrolls and library of Ugarit. i started to see a lot of trends and i had no idea what that meant <laughs> yeah. um, but you start looking at things like discussions about what is faith what does pistis actually mean right uh, how do we understand grace how do we understand the law how do we understand all of these concepts that are really really big and very central to protestant understanding of things mm -hmm. you can understand a lot of them and and remain a protestant and a lot of people do a lot of the people that I'm, i look at that i was reading at this at, at that point were protestant scholars talking about it who remained protestant mm -hmm. but what happened with me is that i then encountered orthodoxy and i started to say yes there are things that are different but there's also a lot of continuity <laughs> when i start looking at the original context of things and then start looking at the way that the Orthodox Church understands things. And the places where there was continuity for me also came along with a very like well-organized picture of how everything fit together. And when I saw that, I was just like, I, like, I, I don't know what to do with this anymore. And so yeah. I kept digging and kept digging and kept digging. And then yeah. I got to the point exactly where, where Kevin had talked about that, um, or maybe you talked about it that like you can only get so far reading about orthodoxy you have to actually experience and live and participate and once i started doing that and and my wife and i you know i brought her kind of the first liturgy she went to and she had one of those kind of things where she's like i feel the spirit here i have encountered something here i can't explain this is deeper than anything I've ever experienced. It, it was kind of like there was no a point of no return for us. <laughs> uh, and then it came to the point of here are the things that I still don't know what to do with coming at this from a Protestant angle and trying to understand things. And then over time, starting to kind of absorb more and more the way that orthodoxy generally kind of understands things, the mind frame. 
and then from there things started to fit more and more into place and right. then that's where i feel like i am today and i'm still very early in it really but that continuity when i look at things and i say there where there's continuity between what a lot of you know scholarship is saying and what the church is saying that's powerful to me when there are places where scholarship is saying things differently now i'm just looking at it from the lens of saying okay it's interesting that they see that differently why is that and i want to know more but but i'm also very much connected into a church that has been around from the beginning and that has a lot of continuity to it and so i'm i'm just less likely to jump immediately into something that right. doesn't quite fit that does that make sense yeah absolutely and you know sherman i think this is an excellent segue we're <laughs> one question we're 45 minutes in so i want to i want to get this out there before you and kevin have to go so, so the protestants don't get to ask any questions at all you or? will you will let me let okay. me get these let me get this question out of the way Dale. and the floor is yours brother um so what let me oh, where is it okay how has your perception of the role of the church in your life changed since becoming orthodox this is so, a general question yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah so yeah. i would say that uh, as far as at least for me um there's a couple of things one was actually uh caleb who unfortunately was not able to join us today yeah. sent me a message that really brilliantly mm -hmm. um i think deals with that question he said uh hey another thought of why i'm orthodox might be worth mentioning the freedom as orthodox Christ christians sorry um questions regarding the meaning of the sacraments the type of church polity we should have how we worship whether soteriology is synergistic or monergistic um, are all completely settled. There is no debate. Because of this, we're free to pursue our spirituality and prayer life instead of pondering these long settled questions. I really love yeah. that because, you know, when, when I was a Protestant, one of the frustrating things for me was the fact that all the time it's like, people would come at me, you know, and say, well, what about this Bible verse? And I'm like, well, what is that Bible verse? What are you trying to get at? And what they would say would inevitably be, you know, some heresy that the church had already dealt with. Mm -hmm. And then you would say, oh, well, that's just Arianism, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, who cares what some church council says? I just have my Bible. Like, mm -hmm. okay, but these questions have already been dealt with. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel every year. We don't need to keep going back to these same things. Mm. We don't need to ask whether um, I remember one time somebody was debating with trying to debate with me about, well, Presbyterian church polity is this and Baptist church polity is this. And, and these debates are just so monotonous. And the reality is they're also irrelevant because for 2000 years, the church has already known what works. Yeah. The church has already been doing theology. She doesn't need to keep readdressing what kind of polity is best, what kind of soteriology is best. Um, those are all settled. And then there's never so, any closure, right? Right, exactly. In mm -hmm. Protestantism, there's never any closure. Whereas in Orthodoxy, these things are already settled. So we're actually set free by that. Um, so that's one thing. And that's what Caleb said. I would also just say that, you know, tradition has, for me personally, I think the most important thing has been that tradition has enabled me to experience the faith in a very different way. So one thing that I'm always struck by is the fact that, like, for example, uh, when I was a Protestant, the church that I was a part of was really into Gregory Bonson. Mm. Uh, he was like kind of the guru, the grand poobah of our church. Is that Bonson um, or Bonson? <laughs> 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 you priest up man, you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, but yet when I would look at the broader Protestant world, I would be quoting Bonson all the time. And by and large, people would just be like, who's that or i don't care 
Whereas when, you know, when I discovered the church fathers and things, it was like now, instead of just, I don't care who's that, all of a sudden you start quoting the fathers and, you know, somebody might not care, but at the same time, like you're realizing how these things change your own life. It's like, right. oh, wow, this is this is transforming me. I don't really care if somebody else is debating with me about it. This is transformative. This is powerful. This is real. And so that's how tradition has just really radically altered my spiritual life is just the fact that you have this long line of people who have actually become saints and show us the way that we can tread to become saints as well. Mm -hmm. And there's not just this constant guy with a new idea who's really, mm -hmm. really intelligent. So we all have to listen to him kind of thing. It's just really, it's more like I'm experiencing this radical transformation and yeah. I don't know. That just seems a lot better mm -hmm. to me, but, um, but I took a whole bunch of the floor, so I'll let everybody else go. <laughs> well, I'll just say this real quick and then people just, you, you guys can jump in after me, Dale. I know you had something, but first Timothy three fifteen. really, I view this in a completely different way now. Right. And if we want to kind of jump on this, we can, or Dale, if you want to ask uh, a question about, uh, the, the scripture, but uh, look, uh, let me just start at 14 real quick. So I'm reading now the ESV. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. What? Like, I, I never heard that before, right? I mean, I've heard it a million times, but I never seen it. And, and so, you know, my understanding of tradition, my understanding of the church, especially, I would love to do a study on from the Septuagint or even the Masoretic text. It doesn't matter at this point, but from Old Testament to New Testament and to the things in between and even in the church fathers, I would love to do an in-depth study of the church mm -hmm. one of these days. And I think that would be a really good uh, series even to get into, but, but Dale, um, Go ahead. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I've written down a million, a million things <laughs> yeah. but for the sake of time. I'm just going to reduce it to two uh, question, probing questions kind of thing. So yeah. my first question is going to be aimed at Josh, but I'd like to hear if there's any disagreement. So you said something very interesting, starting with about errors, right? So even yeah. as a Protestant, uh, you, you were open to biblical errancy and that's not a problem. A lot of Protestants are open to that. As well so we can be the exact same now here's here's yeah, my yeah. question so but, I, well, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that i'm open to errors what i'm saying is the kinds of things that people have in their head when they make categories and they think this is a category where if it, if it doesn't fit this way of thinking it's an error i think that's the problem does that oh, make sense so so you you are a biblical inerrant inerrantist then but but not in quite the way that that the chicago statement would put it okay right okay um, yeah. So um, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm fine with contradiction. What I'm saying is that a lot of the way that people read the scriptures now as modern people, they're looking at things and asking questions that scripture wasn't really even trying to address. And so for them to say this contradicts the way that I understand the world, there's some th places where that makes sense. And there's some places where it, it's kind of a weird thing to do. Uh, and so I, I just want to point out that, that I think there are places where people are doing that in, in a way that doesn't really make that much sense. And then that's where I would would kind of um, step back from that word inerrancy, even though I'm not going to say that there are errors in Scripture. Does that make sense? OK, OK, cool. Hey, so, so uh, let me Dale? Oh, hey, Dale. <laughs> I haven't um, asked my question yet, but okay. No, I'm no. The uh, so as, on the inerrancy thing, I actually just wanted to point you to a resource that might help you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a book called The Whole Council of God, and I've actually been going through a book club on that book over on my YouTube channel, Shameless Plug. Um, What's so your YouTube if you, channel called? It's Freed Indeed Ministries. Okay. I'll put so a if link you in the check, description. 
Uh, thank you. So, yeah, if you just want to check out, there's a whole Council of God, and the very first topic we talked about in that was actually, if I remember correctly, was actually inerrancy. Hmm. So just if that's something you're interested in, um, because I would say that the Orthodox Church does actually believe in inerrancy, um, and I think Father Stephen DeYoung has a really good exposition on that. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just wanted to make sure, because I know that sounded a little, it sounded like you were a little bit confused by the way that term was used earlier. That's the author. Yeah, of that I probably book, was confusing. Know. So, <laughs> no, yeah, so, so no problem. Then. So yeah, so yeah. Ju just to clarify, a, a way of potentially as a, as a methodology of judging the veracity or falsity of uh, orthodoxy would be using scripture, which all of us agree is an inspired authoritative source. And we can use that potentially to judge orthodoxy. If there is a uh, contradiction that's provable, um, that would be a way of falsifying orthodoxy. Would you guys all agree with that? No, because I don't believe that you outside of the church ha are going to have an accurate understanding of scripture. I would believe I would believe that the church had an accurate understanding of scripture. So that was kind of what I was talking about earlier with the predestination thing. When I first came into the church, one of the things I really struggled with was uh, just to be totally open with you, I came from a Calvinist background and I really loved Calvinism and it was very difficult for me to let that go. Um, but, and there was lots of proof texts, you know, I had been taught so many texts of scripture that were these proof texts that, oh, this has to be predestination because it says this word and I can't understand that any other way. But as I came into orthodoxy, it wasn't that my understanding of all those texts changed right away. It was that I didn't believe that I had the authority to decide that me by myself knows more than all these church councils and all these holy fathers and all these people who are frankly just way better at Christianity than me. Um, I wasn't right and they weren't wrong. So... All I'm saying is that I think the idea that like I'm going to come along and say, hey, me and my Bible under a tree found this. So now orthodoxy is bunk. That's a very arrogant approach uh, to the scriptures. And I don't think that that actually works. So I would say no to your question. No such thing as a provable. It's not provable, at least as a solo person kind of thing. OK, uh, everyone would. Might I mean, it. I, I do think we should expect them to be be consistent, you know. Uh, but yeah, how, how you right, go absolutely. about that exactly, absolutely. and what, where your your standard for the validity of measuring one particular side of that equation and the other side of that equation that that is an interesting discussion for sure. Yeah, would, Michael, I saw you raising your hand. So. Yeah, my my question would be: Would Protestantism have the same yardstick of measurement? And the, what I mean by that is. If you look at most of the reformers, I, I shouldn't say most, I don't want to exaggerate. If you look at reformers, they disagree on what scripture actually is. So if you look at something like Sola Scriptura, and then Martin Luther said, well, disputed books were what James, Hebrews, Revelation. He put those at the end of his, his Bible because they were disputed. So mm -hmm. from at least from my perspective, it seems like they were James mostly the disputed same. by him, but that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Like yeah. if you're looking at Protestantism as a whole and reform the reformers as a whole, then would that discount the validity of Protestantism? Because he came out and said these were books that are disputed when most of church history would disagree. So, like, would that also discount at least what he said? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but I think it's the same type of question. Yeah, yeah, I think it is the same type of question for sure. So all right, cool. Uh, and Father Jonathan, do you have anything to say on that? Or do you want me to move on to my second question? No, move on, please. Okay, cool. So my second thing, so this is something that a, a whole bunch of you guys were talking about, about, you know, this individualistic thinking and using your own reason. I think someone quoted, you become your own Pope and stuff like that. Um, but obviously the Protestant position isn't exactly that. I, I would point to scripture and say that is backed up. That's what the Bereans did. That's Second Peter tells us, warns us to be us to be on guard. He doesn't say go to a council and let them us tell is you. Us plural. 
Sorry? Us is plural. Yeah, exactly. Every right. individual Christian, which is what the church you know, is. Every individual Christian as a group, though, as, as the church, not just some guy in his basement with a book. Okay. Right. So, okay, so I'm going to get to my question then. So the thing is, though, I think that Protestants and uh, the Orthodox are really in the same boat here. And this is what I want to get your guys' take on. Because, look, Protestants are saying individuals reading scripture guided by the Holy Spirit. And obviously we can talk to other Christians. That's why the Bible says it's not of private interpretation. We can work things out. But whether you're in the Orthodox, you're appealing to these bishops who hold these councils. They're using human reasoning. We, we know the process. But they're guided by the Holy Spirit, and that's why you guys think they're authoritative. So I, I see it as the same process, right? We're, the Protestants are saying we're guided by the Holy Spirit reading Scripture, and we can arrive at closed truths. Jesus died and rose from the dead. Every Protestant, that's closed in the canon of Scripture alone. We don't need anything else for that. So we can make progress. Um, I, oh, I think wait, wait, Dale, Dale I have to interrupt you for a moment. Uh, first of all, the Bible says no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, not the, not the rest of Scripture. The, the problem with your question is, for example, take take John uh, um, John six, John eight. I'm, for some reason, I'm, you know, when Jesus went through the the, the whole uh, this this is my body, this is my blood. You know, my my my, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. People then listening to him misinterpreted what he was saying. So when the question comes down in our day and age, is the Lord's Supper truly, really a manifestation of his flesh and blood? Or is it merely some kind of symbol or not even a symbol? And you've got Protestants all over the place on that one. Mm -hmm. Protestants, presumably, as you just said, guided by the Holy Spirit, reading the same thing coming to vastly different conclusions, then they're not guided by the Holy Spirit. Someone's wrong on all of that, or most of them may be wrong on some of their interpretations. So the Holy Spirit is supposed to guide us into all truth, but there's a process by which that's achieved. And that process is going to include what other godly people, guided by the Holy Spirit, understood as the consensus of the mind of the church. So it's not just going to come because I have the Holy Spirit and I can open my Bible and read it and automatically snap my fingers and understand exactly what I'm reading. Because the, the, the discourse in John about the body and blood is just but one example. And you can go through other examples about intercessory prayer or Mary or infant baptism or whatever it happens to be. There's going to be misinterpretation by people claiming to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Okay, I, I so just want to make that clear. Just, just to clarify that, so what you're saying is, look, we have proof that the Holy Spirit is actually authoritatively guiding the Orthodox process, the bishop council process, because there's unanim uh, unanimous opinion. There isn't divided opinion, whereas individuals reading the Bible guided by the Holy Spirit, if that's the process, well, look, you've got different opinions everywhere. That shouldn't be the case. So that's... I, I, think I wouldn't say right. unanimous opinion, right. right? Some of the councils, there was disagreement. Uh, Arius didn't come away from Nicaea uh, changing okay. his ways, right? Um, but but if you look at something like Irenaeus and the way that he talks uh, about things when he is pushing back against different groups of heretics, right? Okay. Uh, and, and in this context, we're talking about various groups of Gnostics, Marcionites, um, uh, people following Saturninus, <laughs> and Basilides, and these, these different groups. Um, most of which people have never heard of. <laughs> um, but actually, um, many of which uh, their ideas live on in, in groups now that are just now discovering some new truth that happens to be an old heresy. <laughs> um, but the way that Irenaeus talks about it is, is he's basically saying, you know, what we end up doing when we're, when we're pushing back against uh, these heretics is we will take them, you know, to the scriptures and then... Um, if, if they don't agree with that, then we will tell them, well, this is what the church has always taught, right? Mm -hmm. This is what John taught. This is what, what his, his disciples were taught. This is what the disciples of, like, this is what has, has been passed down and been consistent over time, right? Then, then, then how do you push back against that being part of one of these other groups that says, no, we actually have the truth, right? 
it's hard to do that when you can demonstrate the consistency of of that what's been what's been understood and passed down over time. And I think that's the the difference is that we're what we're talking about when we're talking about a debate nowadays is we're talking about a moment in time, people with different opinions and different groups trying to prove their what they're saying in a moment in time. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about things from an orthodox perspective, we're also looking at it and saying, like, we can go through time <laughs> and okay. say, like, this is how it was consistently hmm. understood. And that's why John Calvin is wrong. Right. And that's why right. Martin Luther is wrong. Right. So there's a whole different dimension to the whole conversation when you're talking about the consistency of what the church has, has, has understood and, and passed on over time. And, and that's where. I started, the more I started to look into this myself, the more I had trouble kind of saying, at what point can I stop and say, this is the place where I can put my, my pillar of truth and disagree with anything earlier than that. Then you start to have to kind of get into these uncomfortable conversations of, you know, Athanasius is my boy when he's talking about the incarnation. But when he talks about almost anything else distinctive theologically, then, you know, I disagree with him on on um you know things like real presence i disagree with him on uh the 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 what the sign of the cross actually does and the fact that there is power to that like it's it it becomes kind of hard to find your representative in early in history when you realize that what you're doing is finding someone that agrees with you on one point but if you look at the holistic picture they disagree with you on a whole bunch of other things mm -hmm. and and that's i think partly where the 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 difference in this conversation comes when we're trying to to ground things in how do we agree on things? How do we understand this? How do we sort out different interpretations? We're talking about trying to take what the church has said all along consistently. And, and, that, and then, of that, course, if that, there are places of inconsistency, we can look at those. Right. Yeah. And, and Dale, that really what, what Joshua just said really needs to be emphasized. You said earlier, you guys say it because a council or a bishop says it. No, we say it because John taught it or James taught it or mm -hmm. Paul taught it. And when you read mm -hmm. St. Paul's letter to Timothy, what does he say? Timothy, my son. Yes, Father Paul. What I have taught you, teach. and he's not saying to the community what I've taught you. He's saying mm -hmm. to Timothy, what I've taught you is an episcopus. What I've taught you, teach to other men mm -hmm. that they may teach other men. Now, so St. Paul is the first generation of Christian, and Timothy represents the second. The men he, that he teaches, that Timothy teaches, are third, and the men they teach are fourth. I've always, this is the question going back to, to, to why I left Protestantism and evangelicalism way back in my high school years. This is what, this is the question I came to was, what did those third and fourth generation men teach? Mm -hmm. Now, if we knew what they taught because they were taught by the apostles, then it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And we know what they taught because we've got the apostolic fathers. That's the third and fourth generation right there. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. So thank you guys for your answers on that. Um, David, I, I don't know if you have a, some questions of your own or. I, I did want to make one little clarification uh, first. I think something that uh, your question kind of assumes, I loved your question, by the way, um, but I think something your question kind of assumes is you said, you know, Protestants and Orthodox are kind of in the same boat because we're both just trying to be guided by the Holy Spirit. But Protestantism and Orthodoxy have a radically different understanding of how the Holy Spirit leads the church. Okay. So for us, what holy tradition is, is the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. That's what tradition is. So when we are appealing to tradition, we believe we are appealing to the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's kind of why, with your first question, when you said, well, can I just quote the Bible and refute orthodoxy? I know that wasn't your question, but I'm simplifying it uh, for time's sake. But when, when you said that, I said, well, no, because, you know, we have this unbroken tradition. So we actually believe that that is the Holy Spirit working in the church. And so I would, I would say that that's kind of, it makes the way that your question is worded a little bit different, if that mm. makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So you're, you're saying like the, the role of the Holy Spirit is only when whatever the pro going through the motions of the process uh, to make this tradition authoritative or whatever it is, but it's in Protestantism, it's more like the Holy Spirit has an active role with the individual, with every individual believer when they're reading scripture. So, or something like that. Uh, 
I would say that the Holy Spirit's active role is what we see in tradition, and that tradition is just the word that we use to describe the Holy Spirit's active role over time in the church, whereas it seems to me that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that your question has this underlying presupposition that sort of any believer can claim to have the Holy Spirit as he's, <clears throat> excuse me, as he's approaching the text of scripture and that that claim is sort of equally verifiable and, and everybody just has to be kind of on the same level with the Holy Spirit. Um, and I know you wouldn't, you know, say that like, well, Arius obviously has the Holy Spirit, so we have to listen to him. But, you know, I think there's sort of a general tenor that maybe you would say that like John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul both have the Holy Spirit and they're both approaching the text, but they're coming to these radically different conclusions. So, you know, I know R.C. Sproul says in his lectures that that means one of them is sinning, um, but God will forgive both of them or something like that is how he words it. Um, but see, in orthodoxy, we would say that tradition itself teaches us what the Holy Spirit is revealing to the church. And so we don't have to say, you know, well, John MacArthur and well, who's the Holy Spirit really leading John MacArthur or R.C. Sproul? We know that, you know, there's this unbroken tradition that shows us where the Holy Spirit is really leading because he's not going to contradict himself. Um, so that's just how I would uh, kind of reframe the question a little bit. But I appreciate the question a lot. Just real quick, Kevin. So let me clarify something. So is it because of the consensus among the church fathers? Is that why you would say that the we know for certain the Holy Spirit is leading these people because they agree? So it's uh, I wouldn't say that it's just the consensus of the okay. fathers. I would say that it's the unbroken um, succession over time. Father Jonathan might be able to word this better than I am, um, but I would say that it's really the unbroken tradition over time. Um, so not just in the first two or three centuries or whatever, um, although that's very important, but over time having this unbroken tradition is what really demonstrates, and the fact that we can trace that all the way back to Jesus himself, which is the one that, you know, he's the one on whom all the promises rest, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would hope that all of us agree on that, including Protestants, that all of these Protestants only matter, or I mean, all of these promises only matter because of Jesus Christ. And so having that unbroken succession that actually takes us to Jesus Christ, um, you know, Jesus promised that he would give his Holy Spirit to his church. Mm -hmm. And if you have that unbroken succession, you can see that that church is the one that has the Holy Spirit. Um, but like I said, I might need to defer to Father Jonathan to word what I'm trying to say better. So one of the questions you asked earlier, Tyler, was how you see the church differently. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the ways that that, that hit me that I think is, is relevant to this discussion in a number of ways as well, once you really dig into it, mm -hmm. is asking how we relate to the rest of the church over time. Mm -hmm. Not just in the writings of the fathers, not just in um, the, the traditions, not just in um, what we have written down, the history we see, but how do we understand something like the communion of saints? which, uh, you know, in a lot of Western churches is part of the Apostles' Creed. Um, mm -hmm. That's not the creed that uh, Orthodoxy, you know, says in, in their liturgy, but um, but they, they don't need to because the communion of saints is demonstrable in the liturgy, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when I walk into an Orthodox church and I look up, I see at the top of the dome Christ, the head of the divine council, right. the one who is, you know, the Almighty, right? I see below him, surrounding him, prophets and the, the writers of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And as it, you come down, you have icons of different saints, right? The whole thing that's meant to describe 
is that what we are doing is we are entering into heavenly worship. We are entering into the communion of saints. We are connecting into across both, you know, space and time, the, the worship of God in, in the eschaton, <laughs> like the marriage feast of the lamb, like all of this is meant to like, we're connected in some very real way because we're tied into who God is um, through the Holy spirit. We're part of the body of Christ. We're partaking of, of the Eucharist. All of these things are meant to tie us into what it means to be part of the church, to be part of Christ's bride and body, to be part of his, his divine counsel. Like all of that is connected in there. And when you see that, it helps to put into perspective things you hear sometimes from people where, um, you know, when someone joins the Orthodox Church, you'll hear, you'll see people say, welcome home, mm -hmm. right? Looking at that from the outside, personally, before I became Orthodox, that felt weird to me. Mm -hmm. It felt like, what a paternalistic thing to say. What a sectarian thing to say, right? Having gone to liturgy, having experienced that sense of community with the saints over time, like th this whole kind of dynamic of what liturgy actually is, I get it now. Mm -hmm. Because what you're saying is welcome into this family that you are connected with here and now. You, you don't have to wait until the eschaton. Like there is a connection to the entire body of Christ here and now. Right. That is, is, is amazing. And that is part of, I think, to me, what underscores this idea of the continuity over time when we're looking at things like what has the church passed down in tradition? What do we have in the writings of the church? What do we see in the liturgy that's been consistent since who knows what, I mean, you know, the, the basis of a, of a lot of the liturgies of the churches were written by John Chrysostom and Basil, right? Mm -hmm. Like th these are, are saints from like <laughs> pretty early on, uh, not super early if we're trying to compare to, you know, Justin and Irenaeus and, and Ignatius. Um, but if we're comparing to people like Martin Luther and John Calvin, mm -hmm. like there's a millennium between them. Yeah. A thousand I years, more than a thousand years. Like I, I just, yeah. I'm just kind of very quick question. Because again, yeah. I know I, we're limited on time. Yeah. Is it official Orthodox doctrine that God? Because what what you're describing, it sounds like you have to believe God is timeless. Um, is that the case? Is it official Orthodoxy that yes. God is timeless? Yeah. God is outside of time. Time is part of the created uh, is part of creation, and God exists outside of it. But through the incarnation, has entered into it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay. What, what would you guys make? Because as a philosopher, I have problems with that. God is temporal, um, I think, right? And that like, he is spaceless. I would agree with that. Am I, well, I guess it would be, no, it's probably the same thing because I'm using human reason to judge orthodox doctrines. It's just kind of like a non well, standard for you guys. It's, no, it's, it's more, it's more like, think, think about it this way, right? Can you understand what it's like to be a bat what it's like no yeah. i don't have the quality of of being a right. bat. so you you can take your mind and you can think what it would what it would be like to be in a bat body flying around right mm -hmm. you can kind of do that but to take your understanding <laughs> and then try to translate that into what is it like to actually be a bat with the kind of understanding they have you can't really do that if we can't do that with a bat, how in the world can we pretend to do that with God? <laughs> right. Um, so th this is the like the, the kind of, of distance between us and God. The, the way that you see this described is 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 this um, sense of like when we talk about in philosophy the the essence of things, right? Mm -hmm. There's a misunderstanding actually that Aquinas had where he kind of uh, understood um, some of the Greek fathers as saying that the God would have like super duper essence, like extra essence or something. But like, no, no, no. God is beyond all, what our concept of essence even is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very tough thing to try to even conceive of God and try to wrap our heads around him. And, and that's one of the places where I would look at it and say, okay, the tradition of the church is this. This is a mystery that's beyond the, our, our ability to fully understand. I'm going to accept what the church teaches and I'm going to you know, move forward 
with some sense of comfort in the midst of that mystery, knowing that knowing it all isn't the thing that matters, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing God mm -hmm. is the thing that matters. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, okay. So this, and, I would push back, but it's not about my views, but uh, yeah. I, I would argue, look, I would just come back. I have propositional knowledge. And in this particular case, that is sufficient. I don't need the quality of being God to understand that there's a logical contradiction or something like that in in supposing that god is temporal or that there's a, a problem or something like that so um yeah go ahead so you know i i actually really love your question partially because i'm a philosophy nerd so this is the sort of stuff i love to just chew on all the time <laughs> um here. there's a there's a wonderful video called how thinking about jesus it's something like how thinking about jesus will mess with your concept of time it's from mm. Jonathan Pajo, and you'll love it um, because you like thinking about this sort of thing. Yeah. So I know that like William Lane Craig is really into the idea that God is temporal and that um, God is not outside of time, basically. Um, and what I would kind of push back on that would be that we would say um, that there's different ways of perceiving time and there's no reason to think that God perceives time in the same way that we do. So we perceive time in a linear fashion in mm -hmm. which we um, experience you know, yesterday and then yesterday is gone and today and then tomorrow is yet to come. Um, but there's no reason to think that God experiences time in that way. So the way in which I believe scripture reveals God is that he is everywhere present and fills all things. Mm -hmm. He is, he experiences what the Greek fathers call uh, Kairos time as opposed to Kronos time. So okay. Kronos time is what we experience. Uh, that's where we get the word chronology. You know, mm -hmm. there's, one event then another then another but god because he's omnipotent he's able to experience everything all at once so god is just as much with abraham and in abraham's life right now as he is in my life and your life right now because there is no progression of time for him there is only the eternal now he ex he's everywhere present and fills all things. Otherwise, uh, I would say that there, philosophically speaking, there becomes a contradiction between viewing him as omnipotent and um, and viewing him as somehow bound by time. So that would be how I would kind of go through that because i love this sort of philosophical stuff too this, so this sounds like an episode that needs to happen between the two of you <laughs> I've, oh, I've done like i think a two-hour episode on it but yeah you're up my view is william lane craig's view basically and okay. that that entails without creation god is timeless right so i have to admit i screwed up when i said it's logically oh. contradictory no it is conceivable for god to be timeless and it's logically possible um, but I would just say it comes with oh, so once creation exists, there are certain this, factual contradictions that arise. But this is this is where there may be something that's helpful here in in the way that the, the Eastern Church understands things. Mm -hmm. You're probably operating without the essence energies distinction, mm. right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Like. Yeah. I mean, most people in, in Western theology do because they've never heard of. It. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> there are, are ones that have heard it and reject it, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, but um, essence energy. But so we might we might say something like, you know, God in His essence is mm -hmm. timeless, and yet He works in His energies in time, right? Okay, um, that might be one way to say it. Um, I don't know if that's totally accurate, but this is that's something available to us as uh, in the Eastern churches. We're under uh, trying to trying to talk about some of these things is to say, okay, is this a place where that distinction helps to provide some clarity? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, and so I, I will see to people that know way more about it than I do about whether that's applicable here. Um, but it, it, that may be something that comes into play. That's just a, a totally different way of even looking at the question uh, between the two groups. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll, I got to confess, I don't know about the, the energies aspect of it. So I would need to look into that to see whether that makes sense. But yeah. Mm. Um, so they'll, we're, so, or actually, I should say everybody. So we're about the hour and 25 minute mark. Um, do we want to transition at this point? I know David has yet to say anything. Uh, and I want to give him a chance to uh, get his questions out. Uh, so, David, do you have anything that you would like to bring up or do we want to transition? Um, how does it feel to mischaracterize and some of the entire Protestant uh, history uh, and get away with it? You know what I mean? I mean, it feels pretty good. It feels bro. awesome. Doesn't it? No, I'm just joking. No, I, I do see <laughs> a lot of mischaracterizations. Uh, but, but I mean, I, this is y'all's. This is y'all's uh, uh, time to get your opinion out. We. Uh, I'm just glad I'm going second. So <laughs> I'm going to have a lot of cannon fodder here, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm loving the conversation. I mean, you guys are, are uh, doing what I thought you would do and, and you're expressing the Orthodox viewpoint, which is, I mean, I think y'all, even if you say you're amateurs, I mean, you guys are doing a great job. I don't even think uh, father Jonathan's jumped in all that much. He's clarified some stuff, but I guess you guys are doing a pretty good job on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see, uh, the Protestants being uh, new to scripture like you do. And I think if, if, if your view of Protestantism uh, is what it is that I've heard, I would probably not be a Protestant either, but that's not what I have witnessed in history that I'm a church historian. So, I mean, so, one thing, hold on, hold on. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll let y'all talk. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, I mean, but I saw how y'all were just constantly interrupting Dale. So just let me get my, <laughs> my thought out here. Um, I would probably, like I said, I would probably not be a Protestant either if that was my my take. And I think you guys put a finger on some modern problems we have with Protestantism. But uh, mm. I don't think Protestants ever, early reformers, never had this idea of new to scripture that you guys are that you guys proposed. Uh, some guy under the Bible with a tree or with his Bible under a tree. I mean, that's not. I don't think that was can, ever can their intent. I don't even think bit? Luther. Hold on. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. After I'm finished my thought, yeah, sure. uh, that's that's how you capitalize on things, Josh. You you <laughs> you, you go off one section without let the. Well, you're kind of rambling. Things. I am, of course, I am because I'm trying to get a thought out. You know, so, um, but yeah, so I, I, the Protestants never had new to scripture. Wittenberg was barely on the map. Luther wasn't trying to divide anything when he posted the 95 thesis. He was trying to get debate going because he had the same problems as Wycliffe or uh, Wycliffe and Erasmus and um, it, many others. So, um, yeah, it, it's, I, I just, sorry guys, I don't, I don't see. Okay. That David, can I jump in? Sure. Okay. But I, I would, let me. Wanna... Can I ask you one thing, Father Jonathan? After this, could you give me a uh, a collection of church history from an Eastern perspective, if you have any, like lecture series or anything? Sure. Thank um, you. Sure. Uh, just one thought, uh, David. You you are saying we're being somewhat unfair and generalizing and blah blah blah. If if those of us making some of the statements that we've made had been lifelong cradle Orthodox and knew nothing else, I could see you making that criticism. I spent 10 years in evangelicalism, Joshua too, Kevin too, Michael, I'm not sure I know your background, but I, I uh, you come from a Protestant background? 40 years, yeah. Okay, it's not like we don't know from whence we are coming, from what we are talking, we've been there, we've heard it, we've seen it, we've studied it, we were taught it. So it's not like we're saying this somehow to be unfair or to beat down the, the the horrible Protestant heretics. This is what we were taught. And we had an opportunity to learn other things and compare and so forth and come to conclusions that what we were taught in the Protestant churches was wrong, regardless of how it started, regardless of where it came from, and so forth and so on. I know Lutheran uh, Luther, for example, and Calvin and Zwingli, for example, believed in and upheld the ever-virginity of Mary, just for example. But nobody after them did. So I know they respected f what they knew and from whence they learned it, but nobody after them did precisely because of what Luther, and L Luther said that was quoted earlier, I'm only going to believe what I think. 
So um, I'll, I'll just hold this up. This is The Shape of Sola Superturra. This That's is by Keith Mathis, Matheson. Um, having gone through that book, um, I think, for one, David, I, I would definitely agree with you, you that if all we're doing is talking about this, this what, what, what some people call new descriptor idea, I don't think we're addressing the historic Reformation Protestant idea of sola scriptura, right? Um, so partly what we're doing is addressing the, what a lot of modern Christianity understands sola scriptura to be, which then gives way to this, I can sit with the Bible under a tree and I know the truth because the Holy Spirit's with me, which then causes a lot of the problems when you have thousands of people that had disagree on something coming together and then trying to right um that i think the problems with that are, are pretty obvious to both your historic reformed protestant presbyterian lutheran calvinist like uh, denominations and to roman catholicism and orthodoxy right so I, I think we can probably put a pin in that and say yeah we can all see some issues with that and that's not the entire picture when we're talking about what, what Protestants uh, see sola scriptura as. If we start to look into the history with um, sola scriptura in more of a reformed approach that does include things like we are reading scripture with tradition, we're reading scripture with the creeds, um, maybe we're reading scripture with our reformed confession, which I would take issue with because it's a much later way of looking at things. And that's where I have, have issues with, with a lot of that theology is that it's, it's separated from the original context. It's separated from the historic context of the church. Um, but if we start to look at that and say, can I take a view of sola scriptura that includes the creeds, that includes reading with tradition and still maintain being Protestant, I think that's a really good discussion to have on a deeper level, uh, because that that's where I think really the 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 meat and potatoes of of, of a discussion about sola scriptura is, uh, and and I'd love to do that. We don't really have time to do that here, but personally, for me, when I started to look at things like that, I kept running into issues where I didn't see quite how to do that consistently because you end up having to cherry pick from councils and from church fathers the things that you want to agree with them on because you believe it and the things that you don't agree with, uh, even though they're consistent with what the church has, has said all throughout history, right? That's that's where I think we start to run into issues. Uh, and, and I'd love to talk about that more if, if you want to have a longer discussion. Um, I'm not an expert on it by any means, but if we want to do some kind of a panel, it would be definitely very interesting to dive into that because I think that is a core, uh, like a crux of, of this whole discussion uh, mm -hmm. to, to try to deal with that. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. And I'd definitely be up for it. Um, so anybody else, Michael, you've been awful quiet. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. I was letting get everybody get their thoughts out. Yeah, but same here. I, I love this. The, yeah, these guys like make my discussion. job easy, man. So I like, I really like it. Um, Go ahead. I would say, though, something something interesting in, in the discussion. Um, for, for one thing, I hope I didn't mischaracterize Protestantism in any egregious ways that would make you guys feel like um, that you were that you were mischaracterized in that way. Um, but beyond that, I actually was introduced. I didn't talk about it in my introduction because I know I was supposed to, and I probably should have. I was actually introduced to orthodoxy through a Protestant pastor, which is why one of my best friends, who's a reformed mm. Protestant pastor, told me to seek out orthodoxy. So there, there is, a, I wouldn't say consensus, but there's definitely some understanding there because he thought that that would be um where where i was already going and i think something that got discussed like half an hour ago i didn't get to jump in is when i was looking at scripture and how and how the church has um how me being in the church has affected my role my view of the role of scripture and and of the church in general i would actually point to what would early you know this is what got me started down this road is what about early christians like in the first couple centuries of Christianity, what did Christianity look like? Mm -hmm. And it did not look like, I don't think, proofreading a text and pulling out this one particular verse and then having disagreements on that verse and arguing. And I don't think that that's mischaracterizing from a lot of modern, modern Protestantism, because that's what I've seen, is that you take this verse and then you argue for two hours on this verse, or I did. This was me. I love doing this. This was like one of my favorite things in the world is like as a Calvinist was like, oh, let's dig in on this verse. And I just don't think that that was the spirit 
of the early church at all from what we see, because I mean, they didn't have, they might've had one epistle, you know, one letter from Paul as a church or two letters from Paul. And then they had the guidance of the bishops and the guidance of the priests. And that's what they had going on, at least from my perspective. Right on Michael. Thank you for that. So guys, it's getting about that time to start wrapping. I want to ask you all one more question real quick, and then uh, we can give final thoughts. This one by quick. I love it. We're going to have to do part two straight up. Like I, I think that that is very much needed uh, since we, since I got about 15 more questions, I want to ask you both, but, <laughs> but let me, Dale and I were talking about this beforehand, <laughs> Yeah, but let me ask you this. What advice would you give? And we'll start with father Jonathan on this one. We'll go Sherman and then Michael and then uh, David and Dale can give their closing thoughts. And then I will take us out of here. But what advice would you give to someone who is considering either a inquiring about orthodoxy? or B, actually converting to orthodoxy? I think those are two different questions. Um, but Father Jonathan, go ahead. You're muted. muted. You're still muted. Can we unmute him? Or... Yeah. Sorry, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not sure I heard what, what the distinction in the question you're trying to ask. So what would you, uh, what advice would you give someone who's considering inquiring about orthodoxy, like to begin inquiring about orthodoxy, or someone who's actually going to convert to orthodoxy? What, what advice will we give them? Mm -hmm. Oh, what advice? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're inquiring, certainly read. But like um, has always been said, um, find an orthodox church to attend, preferably one in English. The Orthodox Church in America has many parishes across the country. The Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese has many parishes across America, all in English. Um, and all with a, a lot of their parishes have parishes with a lot of converts. So you can ask your questions of people who may be like you, who made a journey. And, and it may have taken, in some cases, years, but they made the journey and they were able to, to come into the faith. So inquire. But, it, but your inquiry is going to have to include an experiential component. Those of you who are in the process of converting, you've made a decision and so forth, be patient. Um, the, the, the fact that, um, um, sorry, the, the fact that you have, um, you know, made, made a decision doesn't mean that, that once the chrism's wet on your forehead, you're gonna understand everything and all your problems are gonna go away. If anything, Either way, when you're inquiring or make, beginning to make the journey as a catechumen, uh, the, the, this is a very God-pleasing thing. But I'm telling you right now, the devil's going to be pissed, and he's going to be mad, and he's going to do everything he can to come after you and try and muck up the work. So just be aware of that. It's going to get harder and a little bit tougher because, um, you know, of, of all the Christian denominations, the Orthodox uh, really are pretty much the Marines. And it's not easy. And boot camp, you know, the catechumen, it can be a little hard. But it, it, it's to let you know that you're, you're entering the body of Christ and you're having to completely reorient how you think and how you act and how you feel and how, you know, how you pray, everything. So it's, it's going to be a bit of a, um, uh, an, an adjustment for some. So just be patient. If you have questions and your priest can't answer them, just ask him how to find the answer because the Orthodox Church has answers. He may not know. I tell this to parishioners all the time. If I don't know, I'll find the answer for you. But I've learned over my 66 years of life that the Orthodox Church has the answer. I just have to go find it. Right on, right on. And just for, you look uh, great for 66. I mean, I thought you, you were. I, I thought you, you were. I thought you were uh, uh, in your 50s. You know, like 50. Yeah, I, I would have put you right there. <laughs> So also for anyone inquiring uh, that is looking for an Orthodox Church, so I attend an Antiochian. Uh, jurisdiction and uh, St. Ananias. It's in Evansville, Indiana, and uh, it's led by Father Daniel Hackney. And um, so Antiochian uh, OCA, uh, so the Orthodox Church in America. Um, is there any more English? Is there? Do you yeah, guys I, I, I go to a Greek parish. And, okay. And 
99% of it's in English. There yeah. are things that are said only in Greek, but it, but most of the time, if it's something that's said in Greek, it's either something the priest is kind of saying at the altar while other things are going on, um, or it's, you know, we're going to say this phrase that's a short key phrase in yeah. both English and Greek. So it kind of yeah. ties you into that history, but yeah. but also makes it very, uh, you know, accessible to people. You'll learn Greek. So Theotokos, oh. like you will oh. learn that word probably your first well, day there. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sherman, what do you, uh, what, what, so let me reread the question then real quick. Well, I deleted yeah, it. I, what I, I got it. All I right. got it. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I mean, take your time. Don't just absorb everything you read on the internet. Mm. Please, please. If you're coming from a place that has a more rigid, fundamentalist kind of background recognize that you are going to have to have an entire change of mindset in order to approach this at all in the way that that orthodoxy understands things um and if you if you try to bring that mindset with you you're going to become an orthoboro and nobody's going to like that and it's not good for anybody <laughs> Um, and this is where internet orthodoxy comes from. And, and th there's just a lot of stuff that, that people try to, it's like the King James only people, but, but of, of orthodoxy, right. You know, I have no problem with the King James, you, have them but too? you try to get, you try to get King James only and, and get adamant about it. And it starts to cause a lot of issues. Same kind of thing when people dive into orthodoxy and, and they, they look at it more in terms of propositional truth. Then they look at it in terms of trying to take on the, participating in it so that their perspective is impacted. So they understand what's going on in the procedural sense so that the propositions actually can fall into place in a way that's actually consistent with living it. Mm -hmm. um, because that's that's really where it is, is, is living it. The one example I would give of kind of understanding more as time goes on, right? In my parish, there's there's a hymn that's sung to the Theotokos before, right before the, the Eucharist is given, right? Mm. Coming into it right away from a Protestant background, that was really weird to me. And I'm sure that for anybody that's from that background that's listening to this right now, it would it sounds really weird to you. Me too. Me too. Right. <laughs> yeah, like I totally, I totally get that, um, and and you know, frankly, there's still things I'm adjusting to. It's it's not like I I just totally you know, you know, oh everything the church says I totally understand. I'm totally on board. Like I'm still learning and growing, and being stretched and 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 challenged in a lot of this. But what I realized about three four months ago in liturgy was, if you go to liturgy, and what you have in your head is. This is about creation and the incarnation. This is about creation and the incarnation. This is about creation and the incarnation. And therefore, it's about salvation for us because we have salvation in Christ because he, he became incarnate, because we become, become part of his body. Like, if that's what's in your head, so many things fall into place. And all of a sudden, I realized, like, why are we singing this song? honoring the Theotokos before we're, we're partaking of the Eucharist, it's because what we're about to experience is another thing telling us that, that, that God became incarnate for our sake, that God became incarnate for the restoration of all creation, right? When that's in your head, it becomes easier to understand how these different things that just seem like they're thrown together and don't make any sense or just mm -hmm. seem like it's out of nowhere uh, or, or feel like really awkward coming from a protestant but a lot of it starts to become something where you go oh like i get it like all of this right and not only is it a celebration of the incarnation it's also a celebration of theosis mm -hmm. of, of what salvation is right because when we when we are giving honor to a saint what we're saying is that we're giving honor to god who brought this person to the place where they 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 were brought to in their life um, and yes, that's synergistic because they cooperated with God in doing that. Um, but there's no way that anyone could ever achieve that on their own. Apotheosis is not a thing, right? It's a work of God. It's a work of, of God in those who cooperate with him. That's what I would say. Sorry, you have to follow that up, Michael. Josh is always I good. I should have saved him for last. I know. No, I, no. I don't know Very... what I can say to follow that. I'm, I'm, but back to your question. With, yeah. Um, 
you know, people who are seeking maybe or just want more information. For me, I actually read Welcome to the Orthodox Church was the first book I read. My Protestant pastor friend also told me to read The Orthodox Way, which I did. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the Orthodox Church, I'm like, well, Welcome to the Orthodox Church. I'm like, well, a lot of this sounds really strange, but a lot of it sounds like stuff I already kind of agree with. And so I just went and experienced it. Mm -hmm. and it's funny because I didn't know what I was doing. I would say, don't be nervous. Yeah, People don't stress. Really loving and understanding. <laughs> don't stress because I stressed. I had a very, I mean, very Protestant mindset. So I'm like, I want to do everything exactly by the book. And then I'm going to go grill this priest about exactly what I have issues with. Uh, <laughs> that was that was my, my mindset going in. And so I, I enjoyed liturgy a lot. And then, you know, so don't be stressed. Everybody's going to welcome you. And then don't be confrontive and combative like I was in the beginning. Because the first thing I did is I walk up to the priest and like, I'm not calling you father. <laughs> that was the first words to the priest in my parents. Open your shot, you right? Father. It's like I can quote the scripture. I'm not gonna call you father. He's like, call me whatever you want. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you? <laughs> um, and so so yeah, don't be combative, but also, you know, people are gonna be understanding. And I took a couple years to work through a lot of the stuff that I had issues with, and I started bringing my kids with me and I, I talked to the priest regularly. I probably drove him absolutely crazy. Uh, <laughs> absolutely crazy. Um, and then, you know, as a catechumen, what father said was absolutely right, is that you're going to have a lot of attack. Like my whole life fell apart, mm -hmm. fell apart for a couple months, um, like right before baptism. Like everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And it was just well, and after thing. too, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, be patient with yourself, be, be open. Even if you don't agree with everything, be open, tell the priest that it's stuff they're going to have heard before and then pray about it and really see, see where you feel God guiding you. For me, it was really clear that God made the path really direct from like the beginning combativeness to all in without hopefully being one of the people Joshua was talking about. <laughs> which I can have that tendency to be a little combative. So I've had to, I've had to work on that. Right on, right on, guys. You know, and, you know, as a catechumen, I guess I'll say a couple things real quick, and then I'll give it over to Dill and David, and then I'll close this out. Um, first of all, I apologize to our audience. Um, we did not get to your audience uh, questions tonight, or this morning, I should say. We will do that, so don't fret. I do have them down, and uh, the next time we have these guys back, because we are going to get uh, this panel back, I think this was a good intro discussion. And I can see a few more episodes actually coming out of this if everybody's up for it. Mm -hmm. um, but we will get to your audience questions on the next go around. Uh, I promise you that. Um, with that being said, you know, if you're inquiring, I, I can't give any advice on anybody uh, that's getting ready to convert. Uh, I'm not even there yet. Right. And so mm -hmm. uh, I would say, you know, I would first of all reiterate everything that everybody else has said uh, to but I would emphasize the patience. This is something that I struggle with because I want to know everything about this uh, religion, right? Like I want it, I want it, I want it. And so um, be patient, take your time. It Catechumen is, so for us, I know it's different with everybody. Uh, our priest makes us wait a year uh, before we are baptized into the church and then that's a whole nother thing you know if you're if you come from different you know backgrounds and stuff you don't have to necessarily be, be baptized um the parish is different it, it just depends on your bishop um the other thing i would say is to taking your time listen to your priest if you are attending an orthodox church regularly um like uh, i think it was sherman that said don't believe everything you see on the internet uh, if you see something that's questionable on the internet ask your priest. He, he's, he's your, it's just like a pastor in a Protestant church. That is your spiritual father. That is your spiritual guide, right? Like this person has been ordained by God, if you want to put it like that, uh, to shepherd over you. And so I do believe in God's providence. And so I do uh, see it like that in a sense. So go to, go to him, ask questions, uh, and listen, be open, like Michael said about things. And, and you know, I'll just say this, and then uh, Dell and David, you can have it. There's been, this thing has been on my mind a lot lately um, in talking about Sola Scriptura and talking about tradition and things like that. 
I am trying. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody to do anything that I'm not, I'm not personally doing myself, but I am really, really trying to have my mind shaped by scripture. I don't want to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. I've realized that uh, recently, and I've realized that in the past as well, it's been brought to my attention again in a humbling, humbling way. Um, but, but want to desire to, and really strive to have your mind uh, changed, repent, right? Uh, uh, by the scriptures, by the text, you know? And so that's what, uh, that, that's the advice that I would give. But uh, Dell, David, closing thoughts, and then I will, uh, I'll take us out. Yeah, and I'm guys. I, I'm sorry for rambling, and and if I questioned oh. your experience, uh, y- I, you know, it how how could we po- how could we possibly take issue with that way. when you know, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, no, um, and and like I said, I, you know, it's hard for me to get get a thought out when you know it's like you know everybody's yeah. jumping in. There was so much to get to, but and I still have a ton of questions, ton of questions, but. Um, I'll leave it there, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm glad you guys came on and, and expressed your views and stuff like that. And, I, and again, I didn't mean to question your previous bouts with your Protestantism, but uh, the, the only thing that I was saying is that, you know, being educated in church history the way I was, you know, is just y'all are the, the, you guys sounded like you were putting out a lot of stuff that I just think was a mischaracterization because, you know, doing the history and stuff like that. I mean, one thing that just came to mind was that, uh, you know, you said the reformers didn't understand things the way they should have understood them because they're a millennium apart. And I would say, I mean, these guys, when, when, when Zwingli, I mean, the man knew and memorized all of Paul's letters in Greek, Mm -hmm. you know, um, to say he didn't have an understanding of what was going on in the early church. I mean, these guys dug into uh, um, the church history in a way that I don't think we do today in in a lot of areas or Protestants do in a way that they should. But also to that, the division, there's only one division that the Protestants had at Marburg. They agreed on 14 out of 15 things. There wasn't this large gap like people think there was, you know, but yeah, I mean, so there's a lot more that could be said about this and church history and so forth. So um, other than that, I think you guys did a, you know, I think it was an excellent job. And I think that um, unlike you guys would say of me, I would share the Lord's cup with you. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's it. I just don't so think we're big on, you know, people drinking their uh, the blood under condemnation, you know, so. Anyway. Yeah, either am I. I mean, I would protect yeah. you, Chris, in that way. But yeah. um I I yeah, I would. But yeah, I don't think you guys have the ability to appetize people. So fair enough. All right. Dell. Yeah. Uh so yeah. We don't. <laughs> Go ahead, Dell. Uh ahead. yeah, so int- interesting talk. Um obviously we didn't cover all the questions on, on your list though, Tyler, but I think we did go into the issue of tradition versus solo scriptura. Mm-hmm. a lot of detail and uh, kind of raised our objections to it to get their answers. So that was great. Uh, and I learned something new about the Orthodox position on God's um, temporal nature or timeless nature. So that was cool. Uh, it's something for me to think about. Um, I think uh, one thing that was, we didn't get a lot of, when I was talking to Tyler uh, behind the scenes a few days ago, he kind of asked me, I was hoping with this show, we would get this question answered. Okay, what positive source of warrant or reason do we have for thinking that orthodoxy in particular is true? And one thing that I'm finding is that with, with and maybe I'm wrong on this, but one thing that I'm finding with orthodox, it's kind of, they're kind of like, they argue like Muslims. Like, well, here Muslims will argue, well, here's the reasons why Christianity is BS and that therefore the default is Islam. So like I'm kind of hearing Orthodox are saying, well, here are the reasons why Protestantism is wrong and stuff like that. And then therefore Orthodoxy. So I'm going to go back and re-listen. If mm. The only thing I, I caught was that there was this interesting talk of this experiential element. And it, this is something Father Jonathan mentioned on a previous show. You, you, you have to participate first and get, I guess, some form of experiential knowledge that 
orthodoxy is true. Uh, um, I'll just say with that that aspect, that may be true. I, I do admit that we can get um, direct knowledge from the Holy Spirit and through experience and stuff like that. But I'm a little bit iffy uh, when someone says that's the only way to go. Because I, when I did my religious research, that's what the Buddhists said. That's what every, the Hindus said and stuff like that. Oh, you, you need to experience and take part and commit to the religion first. Then it will get verified or you'll understand it. And I'm a bit hesitant on that. Like it seems a little bit cultish. I, I kind of have this, maybe it's the Protestant bias in me, but I, I have this notion, no, God will give us proposition sufficient propositional knowledge before i commit and then after you commit sure he can give supplemental experiential knowledge but that's the only one thing i wanted to to say there does that make sense yeah i mean i, I think what you're talking about is basically just um where does the conversation start right and so for a lot of us it started with we were protestant and this is why we're not right um so uh, I, I do think that would be a great further conversation to have more of that kind of positive. Uh, th this is what we found as we, we've gone into this. This is this is what we understand with things. So um, we can definitely, you know, I mean, I, I think trying to talk about the continuity over time, trying to talk about the continuity, um, both in terms of, you know, succession from the apostles, in terms of what people were, were handing down, the teaching being consistent. I think that's part of the orthodox answer to that question. Um it may not be a satisfactory answer for a Protestant. I understand that. Um, but yeah, that would be a great topic for further conversation. Cool. Yeah, and, and I didn't really have time to talk about it, but I also looked seriously at a lot of different branches of Protestantism. I looked at Roman Catholicism. I looked at, um, before I went to Protestantism, I actually looked into Buddhism. So, I mean, I have a lot of kind of at least surface knowledge of a lot of different religions and traditions before I came to this. It's just that Protestant was the one that, that was being asked about in the podcast. So I would love to answer any other questions because I've done a stupid amount of research because I'm a researcher and I research everything mm -hmm. to the nth degree. So. so maybe we can do that next time that you guys maybe hold off on the questions that I have, like actually set the foundations a little bit further than what we did tonight at, had some, uh, positive um, explanations for for this, and then we, we um, might get that tomorrow with uh, beloved beloved Mitch. Mitch, uh, Protestants always get butt hurt, so I'm I'm looking forward to getting butt hurt tomorrow with <laughs> with Mitch on the show and learning. From him. Are you are you going to be there, Dale? I, I'm going to make the time to show up. Yeah, because I want to hear what he has to say for sure. Awesome. Yeah, Mi Mitch. Oh, I love Mitch. Uh, he's more. He's not soft. I'll put it like that. Uh, he's that's uh, cool. That's he's totally a little confrontational. Awesome. So I'm excited um, to, I want to get him in a debate with somebody. Um, I don't know. We'll see what Mr. happens Russell. with that. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, t I toned down the conversation because I was new here. Why does everybody want to debate me? <laughs> Why do you guys want to put me on the spot? We can just buy that back and eat popcorn, Dale. <laughs> well, yes, I you mean. Are. Yes, I am. You got those little snippets you, man, that I'd you like to there. throw out. Uh, so. I would have been throwing Sattler in the, in, the, in the fire too. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Uh, anyway y'all but thank you to our audience you guys have been awesome guys and gals uh please again if you like the content give us a thumbs up comment get the youtube algorithms liking us so more people can see what we're offering uh we do take priority in discussing differences and yet without being so disagreeable that it turns into animosity or even hatred. I've seen this on social media a lot, and I think that that's one time, one thing that you know we at Faith and Altered really, really try to do. We we joke with each other, we stab at each other, uh, but it's all in a um, I think in a attitude of love. And so, with that being said, again, thank you. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you if you really like the content, you want more from us. Hit that notification bell. Uh, set it to all and you will be um, notified every time we upload a video or we do a live stream like this one. Uh, big thank you to the panel uh, for joining us today and, and dedicating your time to this. I really appreciate it. This is this has been a lot for me, you know, in, in my um, catechumen phase now with with the Orthodox Church. You guys answered a lot of questions for me and I'm really, really appreciative. So so just know that, you know, leaving this. Uh, but without anything else, I think that it's time to wrap up. So again, thank you all so much. Good night.
good morning, good afternoon. I don't know what it is. What, what, where are we right now? No, good afternoon. Have a great weekend. God bless and stay like Christ.